crew. We got a special one today, yo. I got my boss in the mix, Dr. Phil Wells, head of the Department of Medicine, ultra scholar. I've lost track of how many publications this gentleman has. And we talk decision making in medicine, how the fact that we are very risk averse, how does that impact patient care? How does that affect resource utilization? How do we promote innovation? Why is medicine so resistant to change and artificial intelligence? is the future and how it can make us help us make better decisions. We cover all that with Dr. Wells. And so I'm really looking to you guys to hear this episode. I recorded this back in October of 2019. So yeah, you're going to hear my lack of skills, man. Like uh, It's raw, yo, for real. But before jumping into it, I want to remind you guys, did you miss our low carb keto conference? We are selling the recordings 29.95 with Ivor Cummins. Joy Kitty and Dr. Paul Mason, knowledge was being thrown down, okay? And this is, once again, we're just trying to provide everybody with tools to get healthier, especially in in the context of the pandemic, do our best to combat COVID-19. So jump on that. It's at solvinghealthcare.ca backslash low carb. Okay. So as I mentioned, Dr. Wells, my boss, he even has his own criteria, which is crazy, the Wells criteria in terms of trying to diagnose uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolisms. He's a hematologist. He has had more publications than I could even speak of. Most recently has a paper out in the New England Journal of Medicine. Straight up gangster, yo. Anyways, without further ado, Dr. Phil Wells. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Dr. Philip Wells. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I got to tell you, you're the biggest wig that we've had on the show by far. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. No, Lisa sent me your CV and it was ridiculous. It might have been 43 pages. It had like Cole's notes. It had like uh, tables of content. It was ridiculous, but thanks for doing this. I don't know if you recall the the first time we met, but I was doing an OSCE first year residency, pretty nervous because it's, you know, you're, you're performing in front of your peers, you know, and I get to this station about deep vein thrombosis and I look at your name tag and it's like, Wells. And I'm like, I know about these Wells criteria. I'm like, is this Wells? Like, are you the Wells with your own criteria? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, dog. This is serious. <laughs> Shook your hand. I'm like, the day I have my own criteria, you know I've landed. But honestly, thanks for doing this. So in terms of issues with our current healthcare system, you know, from your perspective as a clinician or as an administrator, you're the head of the Department of Medicine. Where do you see our biggest concerns? Well, as you know, there are many concerns within the system. I, I, we could talk all day about them, but I'll focus on predominantly one, but maybe touch on, on the second one a little bit as well. Mm. Uh, and the first one I'd focus on would be the fact that I think physicians are risk averse and it leads to bad decision making. The other area is that of resources, and I'll, I'll come back to that. You know, there's insufficient resources to do anything, and we spend so much time talking about what to do with our scarce resources mm-hmm. rather than actually innovating or seeing patients or doing important things to improve healthcare. Mm. But that's a whole other issue. So the risk aversion thing is something that gets to me. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And so risk averse, like what does that look like, to, you know, in terms of like the general public listening now, like what is a, a risk averse activity or that a clinician might do? Well, everything we do, I'm talking about every, I'm really talking about decision making. So decisions on treatment, decisions on diagnosis, decisions on how we manage our patients. And a person who's risk averse is someone who doesn't take any, doesn't take chances. They're not a gambler. 
I might sound like, uh, you know, what's Wells talking about? Why should we don't want our physicians to be gamblers? And it's true. We don't want our physicians to be gamblers, but we also want them to make decisions that aren't based in being afraid to make decisions. So there's sort of two major areas. One is in the area of diagnosis and one is in the area of treatment. And in treatment, physicians prefer to make errors of commission rather than errors of omission. What does that mean? So an error of commission is if you're not sure which way to go with a treatment, you treat with something rather than not treating. So maybe there's not good evidence to decide either way. Should I use this drug? Should I not use this drug? Should I treat this with a medication? Should I not treat it? Physician's tendency will be to give a medication rather than not. And it ignores the whole side of the cost of using that medication, the potential side effects of that medication, the need to change the way you monitor because of that medication, the need, the fact that you're now labeling a patient because you're treating them with a medication. Mm -hmm. But that's the way physicians tend to work. I've always tended to work before, prefer to make errors of omission because I'm of a, my mindset is don't do harm. So mm -hmm. if you're not sure that something's going to be a benefit, don't do harm. But it's kind of a, it's a culture. It's a mindset. It's how we are taught and, and how we end up practicing. And I think that does lead to some problems. And, and do you think it's, are we attracting risk averse people? Like, is this what happens in medicine? Is like, for some reason, risk averse people are attracted to medicine? That I can't answer, but I can tell you that studies show that physicians, once they're in practice, are more risk averse than the general population. Mm -hmm. I would tend to believe it's the culture that we train people within. Mm -hmm. So i give you an example. It's not even probably conscious that physicians will do this. But let's say you're a trainee and a patient comes in with an undefined set of symptoms and signs that you want to try and, of course, figure out what the problem is. And you will order certain tests based on what you know. But you also order certain tests based on what you expect your staff, how your staff might react right. to what you do. So all it takes is one staff to say to you, well, why didn't you order this test for you now to feel like you've been slated in, in public? And therefore, now the next time around, you're more likely to order tests that are unnecessary to avoid receiving that criticism. Right. So I think that that's a prominent that, factor. That in is all a big this. one, actually. I mean, I'm about 10 years out of training formally and you will tailor your practice investigations therapies based on the staff person that you have in front of you and sometimes we don't breed autonomy amongst our our trainees right so then they are going to draw from that experience from their their mm -hmm. staff and mm -hmm. that's going to be ingrained that's right. going to be set in them and that creates a risk averse type of personality and type of practice mm. right because you're afraid to do things differently. You practice according to the faculty you're working with. So that means that there are external factors that are influencing the way you make decisions rather than making potentially what should be the right decision for the patient right. and for the resources and the resource constraints we have within the system. Yeah. I got to tell you too, like, I feel like within ICU, you know, I, it's a field where I think you know, if the patient's going to get better, they're going to get better. Like it's, I don't think anything I'm doing necessarily is going to be like significantly altering their course. But one of the things I think is essential is like stopping harm from happening, stopping from those extra tests being done. Yes. Do you want that MRI? Why? Knowing that we got to sedate that patient, we got to give them extra medications to make sure that they're calm, they're being transported. So if there's less resources at the time when they're going to be, if something bad were to happen in the MRI machine, like you really got to ask yourself, this thing I'm ordering, is it really going to affect the patient? Is it right. really going right. to make their condition better? Is it going to add to my decision making? Yeah. And I think that that's not the processes that go through people's minds. Mm -hmm. I think that Sometimes diagnostic tests are ordered because we have nothing else we can do and we feel that we have to be doing something. Sometimes they're ordered because we don't have time to do a proper assessment otherwise, like mm. physical exam or history, a little bit different in the ICU. Um, sometimes they're done because we're too busy. You've got a stack of patients in the emergency room. They have abdominal pain. You have to go over and see someone with chest pain. Your first reaction is, well, I don't really have a lot of time to spend with this patient, so I'm just going to order a CT of their abdomen with contrast. And it ignores the issue of harm with diagnostic testing. Mm. So almost all diagnostic tests have potential for harm, whether it just be a contrast reaction, whether it be radiation exposure, or the one that most 
physicians don't think about, and I would suggest most patients have no idea about, is that of false positives. Right. And that's the whole Wells criteria. That was all built on that premise. That was the whole point of it. Can you just explain, because like my mom's listening to this right now, like when you say (laughs) false positive. So every test we do, whether it be a lab test or an imaging test, like a x-ray, a CT scan, an ultrasound, none of those tests are 100% accurate. They're not anatomical specimens that we're looking at when we're doing an x-ray or a CT scan. It's an approximation through this imaging technology. So you can find things on there that aren't real. And that's what's called a false positive. It may be like a a spot you see on the x-ray and that could be normal for you. But when you see it, you don't know what it is. You think it could be a cancer. It might lead to a biopsy, a complication as a result of the biopsy, anguish and emotional distress for the patient when it was actually nothing. And if you hadn't ordered the test, you would never have seen that normal finding. Right. And just think about the other part of that is amongst all the other complications and problems that it can uh, develop is think about the cost. Okay. Exactly. Like just in that example that you gave, you see that spot on, you know, on the liver or whatever on a CT scan that probably wasn't like, we don't feel like it needed to be ordered, Mm -hmm. but it was ordered. Now you maybe get an MRI, another $1,000 further delineated. Right. You get a consult GI or a general surgeon, more money there. Yep. You're going to get the biopsy done, more money there. Mm-hmm. Complication from the biopsy because they bleed, more money there. Now they need to go to the operation room. Now their length of stay is there. Now I'm not going back to work because I got to look after my exactly. grandma. It that is on on. It's, it's exponential, it's, right? It's, it's exponential and it's predictably... Like it's predictable. But you know, the the sad thing about it is the public has no appreciation for this fact, right? Right. So there's also, I think, a pressure from the public for their doctors to do tests. I imagine, and I don't, I haven't seen data around this, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me that physicians who order more tests are probably felt by many patients to be better doctors. Interesting. And I don't know that's for a fact, but I do know that it has been quoted that 5% of the American GDP is spent on tests and procedures which do not improve patient outcomes. Wow. That's massive. And like 5% of a lot is a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like we often will quote nice you, like 1% of our gross domestic product goes to, goes to treating critically ill patients or ICU patients. And that's why we've focused on, you know, areas in ICU because, you know, if you could reduce that percentage, that's a lot of money. And similar to what you're saying in the in the states, like actually, I didn't realize that that's an insane number when you it think about insane. like five percent. Yeah, but yeah, and I, and I honestly, I think I truly don't believe the general public has any idea about this. Like you, you see all these like I don't want to say ads, but people that are that want like these whole body MRIs mm-hmm, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and like, truth be told, I'm a doc. And I would not want any of my family members to go through a whole body scan just to see if we could find something early Mm -hmm. because it will cause you more angst than anything. But I don't know if that's well received in the public, in the public side, or even amongst clinicians too. I I don't know if we are a minority. Like I know I'm a minority, but, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I don't know how docs feel. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I'm not 100% sure either. But by observing the way they practice, I know that there's definitely a tendency to over-image people. Yeah. And have too many visits to the uh, clinic. You were about to jump on, uh, before I interrupted you, about the Wells criteria and the false positives, because I think this ties into a bit of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm, Do mm-hmm. you want to expand on that? Yeah. So the whole concept of that the Wells rules were developed around was to help us understand when patients need to have a diagnostic test. Exactly the thing I'm talking about. So we don't just test everybody. Because the original dogma was, don't bother examining a patient or taking a history because if they have signs or symptoms suggestive of of a clot in their leg or signs and symptoms of a clot in their lung, a pulmonary embolism, you just have to go and do a diagnostic test. Right. But there, at the time, the definitive diagnostic tests were invasive. They're expensive. They were hard to get. So we wanted a tool to be able to help us guide when people needed tests. So the concept is if you have a low probability clinically of having a disease, that's when you're likely to have a false positive diagnostic test. And when you have a high clinical probability of having a disease, 
So let's say, you know, you're lying on the floor, you're overweight, you're a smoker, you're a 60 year old man, you're sweating, you have chest pain, and someone does an electrocardiogram and it says you're not having an MI, you still have to suspect that's a false negative because there's a high probability that you actually have a, or having an MI. So the same principle attack. applies all, yeah, heart attack applies all across medicine. So it's that concept which we want to get people to understand. Mm -hmm. And if you can appreciate that concept, then diagnostic testing will be done less frequently or it could be done less frequently. Right. Yeah, it should be done less frequently. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I guess, because I'm always thinking about how best to even like approach this with the trainees, with the kids. Right. Because we're going to talk about innovation in a bit. And, you know, I think for a lot of docs that have their ways set in stone, I think the, I don't know the expression, the wheels falling out of the barn or, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud here, like about how we can change promote your, this with the kids. Yeah, change the risk averse sort of poor decision making. Yeah. Well, it obviously has to come from the, from some extent, it has to come from the top, from the culture. So we have yeah. to, I think we do have to educate patients. So patients might question their physician, why are you ordering that test? Is it really indicated? Mm. You know, is there another way to determine what's wrong with me rather than ordering this diagnostic test? Mm. You need to give audit and feedback to physicians so they can see how often their tests are negative or cause that, false positives. That is genius right there, actually. Yeah. So we never see that, right? So we started doing that at the auto hospital a few years ago. We started tracking who are our big users of MR and CT. And when we showed these to some of the physicians, naturally, they just had a lot of excuses. Oh, I'm the eMERGE doc who works at nighttime, and at nighttime, we have different patients. We need more tests. Or I work and see different patients than my colleagues, so I need to order more tests. So just showing them the number of tests didn't help. They didn't want to wake up to that fact because it makes practicing medicine easier in their mind. So what we really need to show them how often is your test negative mm. or a false positive when you've ordered when you've ordered it. So I think we can start with our physicians. We also have to get rid of some of that hidden curriculum that I mentioned earlier where physicians, where residents feel, if I don't order all these tests, my staff member will criticize me or, or ask me why I didn't do that test. Mm. So we need to give trainees the trust and the um, capacity, not capacity, but the I suppose it's more the trust that they can tell us when we we've done something that is altering, going to alter their behavior. Because mm -hmm. like I said, it may be unconscious that we're doing it, that we, t we say we sort of criticize them for not having ordered that test. We're not really thinking of the consequences. Mm -hmm. So if the resident could say, well, you know what? Uh, that just made me feel bad about what you said. And can you please give me a reason why I should have ordered this serum rhubarb test, and, um, <laughs> as they say, right? And then I think in the medical schools as well, we have to try and teach people to practice medicine from a societal perspective as well as an individual perspective. Yeah, because the real emphasis is totally on the individual, which yeah. currently. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that, that's fair. But yeah. I do think we need to put more thought into the sustainability of the whole picture. Like, I mean, this is why we're, why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what you said about physician performance, because I actually thought, as you were saying it, I'm like, yeah, that's genius. If I know I'm ordering all these tests, and my outcomes are the same as my colleagues that aren't ordering these tests. You know, I would have thought that would have brought, that would endorse some change in my mind. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, we find that excuse. Mm -hmm. We find that like we're stubborn, because we're stubborn change, cats. Change is hard, right? <laughs> change is hard yeah. for everybody. And I think it's maybe even harder again for physicians because of this risk averse culture we live in. You know, how many studies have you seen where a good randomized trial has proven you should use drug A for disease B. Yeah. And then you look at whether physicians are actually prescribing that drug, and it takes years before they finally start to prescribe that drug, even though there's a good study that supports that they should change their practice. Yeah. So, that, to me, is insane. Insane might be a strong word. It's, it's bothersome. It's disturbing. It's disturbing. Yes. Because, yeah. you know, I'm sure my father-in-law won't mind me mentioning, like, He's had a pulmonary embolism. He's uh, unfortunately has uh, has uh, cancer. I'm sorry. And uh, thank you. And he's getting injections. And you're the man to correct me. There's mounting evidence that using some oral medications as blood thinners are just as effective as getting injections, which you would take once or twice a day in the cancer population. He's still getting injections, you know. And in fact, I wonder if this affected 
compliance. You know what I mean? When you, you got to. Of course it does. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and yeah. why would we still be prescribing? This is, again, comes down to this risk aversion, poor decision making. There's good data from the United States that people who are taking those injections for a long time, their adherence, which means how often they take the medicine, yeah. goes down dramatically over time. And if you stay on pills, it's much better, right? Right. So you think you're doing the patient maybe a favor because maybe you're not completely aware of the evidence and actually the pills are as good or better than the needles. But regardless, you think you're doing the right thing by giving the needles, but you're failing to address the whole patient. Right. You're failing to address... A, the cost is way, way more than the pills. Mm -hmm. B, is adherence. And people, patients don't even tell their physicians most of the time when they're not being adherent. People right. will come in. We were doing this one study. We were looking at this database where this patient came into clinic. They said they were taking the medicine for the last three months, these needles. Right. But when we looked into the provincial database to see whether that person was actually on that medicine, they'd never filled a prescription. And we know that because they're over 65 and they're, they weren't on insurance. So they would have had their medicine filled for the Ministry of Health. So adherence is a major factor. So yeah, I think it's, um, people are slow to change practice. You know, you guys in the ICU are actually, I hate to say it, a very good example of that. I'd so slow, slow to, to, yes, for yes. venous thrombosis. So <laughs> for years, I don't know if it's changed recently because my clinical practice on the wards is less and less. But you guys in the ICU, and I won't know if it's you personally, but you guys favor IV unfractionated heparin over low molecular weight heparin. You are using the more dangerous drug, thinking that you're doing the patient good because you think that drug can be stopped quickly and reversed quickly. But you're using the drug that has twice the risk of hemorrhage and has less, less efficacy than low molecular weight heparin. Yeah. And it has to be monitored. And there's a risk of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And the concept that it takes longer to actually get people anticoagulated sometime, you guys refuse to use low molecular weight heparin when all the evidence suggests that's the right drug. I mean, you're, I, I'm not, I shouldn't pick on you guys. No, I'm no, sorry. But, but. No, but it's good to pick. I mean, it's good to pick because, I mean, the reason I'm not offended is because maybe I'm a school of wells, but I'll, I'll never forget. I was in my first year residency and we had a patient that had a recent intracranial, like had a bleed in their brain that needed to be on a blood thinner because they had a clot in the leg or whatever. I quote this to the kids all the time. I'm like, why would we give something that is more likely to cause bleeding mm -hmm. versus something that is less likely to cause bleeding? Yes, we could turn it off and on quicker or the IV heparin or whatever. We're getting too technical, but this is worth it. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. And I don't know what our practice is in the ICU because I think we do see a lot of var variability. Mm -hmm. But once again, it comes down to there's evidence. Risk averse. Yeah, risk, risk averse. They don't want to change what they're used to doing, right? You've been doing this for years. You're under the impression it's the right thing because you've been doing it for so long. So when the new thing comes along, and low molecular whatever is not new anymore, and there's a, there's a reluctance to change. Yeah, I almost wonder if even just teaching decision-making at an early level would have some value. Because I got to tell you, now in my 10th or 11th year of practice, and like I myself, for whatever reason, I'm invested into decision making. I find the whole thing fascinating. Likewise. Yeah. Like, I think the way we, like, for example, we have this, speaking of clots, if I see a patient that I missed a clot in the leg or missed a clot in the lung, I bet you the weeks afterwards, I'm going to order way more tests right. to see if somebody's got that right. clot in the lung right. or clot in the leg. I we we'll call it re recency bias. Yes. Another one that I think a lot of clinicians do is the, forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but I think it's like the availability heuristic or availability bias. I'm going to come up with my reasoning for this diagnosis is what's most readily available or what I've seen most, most recently. recently. Yeah, yeah. And I think being aware of some of these biases that we have, being aware of our resistance to change and how like- And how it can harm patients. And how it can harm patients. And how actually stupid it is if you take a, a step back yeah. when- you just are resistant to change because you're resistant to change. Or you just saw something that was a, a chance occurrence, which, you know, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I know it's funny. Because uh, I honestly, like my approach, when I teach this to the kids, when it comes to like coming up with your differential diagnosis. So in medicine, when you see a patient that has, a, say, the shorter breath, you come up with a list of things that is possible that there could be wrong with them. When I talk to the kids, I want to know about your top three. And what's most likely or what would potentially be fatal if we missed it. Mm -hmm. 
Decide if it's within the realm of that top three and go after that. Don't tell me about number 10. I don't think they got this, you know, interstitial lung disease from asbestos that they've never had asbestos exposure to. (laughs) So we're going to do a high res CT or do all these funky tests. No, because that will cause harm. Right. They need to know this. And there may be even higher risk of that now because you have the data on your phone now. Like you have access to information on your phone before you had to memorize that list. So if you couldn't remember those 10 things, you only remembered the top three, the chances are you remembered the most important three actually. and not all the zebras, as they say, yeah. the unusual causes. But now you can call, you know, hey, you know, before Quadjo gets here, I'm just going to look up what are all the potential causes of interstitial lung disease. Mm-hmm to show off, but really that was in your hand. So you weren't really, that doesn't make you smart that you looked that up on the phone. Right. It's more important to have common sense and to learn how to do proper decision-making. And and it should be, and because of the fact that all this information is readily available on the phone or on your, in the internet, we should more be emphasizing things like this. like Absolutely. In medical school training, absolutely. Because that's what's going to make a difference. That's what you're, that's what's going to make you a good doctor. Yep. That's right. I think we, there's definitely things we need to do to change the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we need to have, teach people more humanism. We need to teach people emotional intelligence and empathy. We need to train people about decision making. Mm-hmm. We need to give people some common sense capacities. Mm-hmm. We need to teach our medical students how to actually interact with their faculty in a way which is productive for everybody instead of just being quiet when they've been, when that hidden curriculum I mentioned earlier has come up. We have to mm. empower them to actually feel like they can speak to us as equals because they are right. equals. They're just in a different place in their training. I mean, if you think about it, they're the ones that are going to be taking care of us yes. when we're sick. Yeah, you're <laughs> you right. We got to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 59 now. I got to get it. Oh, yeah. I'm running out of chance to train these yeah. guys. <laughs> no, I mean, but I, I do have faith in what I do see, though, in amongst the, the trainees coming up is the things that we're mentioning, they take seriously. Mm-hmm. Like they want to be good communicators. They want to be humanistic. True. They want to make better decisions, but they also don't want to look like idiots in front of us. <laughs> right. So one of the things that I, I personally do not have patience for is I don't like seeing our colleagues grill the kids for the sake of grilling the kids. Mm-hmm. That's old school. And it's it's unacceptable in yeah, 2019. I agree. As you said, we shouldn't be, like there is a hierarchy because of decisions. Like, you know, it falls and on responsibility. me. And responsibility. Yeah. But what's the point of making these kids feel like shit? You yeah, know I mean, no, like th- if you think about also the pressure that they're going through, uh, they're here yeah. at five in the morning, making these decisions, trying to impact patient care and have these positive outcomes. They're worried about us, what we're feeling, what we're going to, how we're going to judge their decisions. You know, they want to look good in front of their colleagues. They got nurse and allied health pressure. Yeah. They don't need that extra, extra juice. Well, and you know, thankfully the uh, University of Ottawa undergraduate medical education program and the Ottawa hospital are taking very seriously the learning environment and trying to address these issues, many of which are hangovers from previous generations or previous, the culture of the past. So we, there are things are being done, but you got to do more. Yeah. Yeah, And, and, and anecdotally, like I do see it getting better. Yeah. It's it's certainly better. Yeah. I want to, this kind of ties into the innovation, like uh, in topic that I wanted to bring up. So we talked offline about how, because of the risk of averse, culture we live in we don't embrace innovation Innovation, it's not right it's not emphasized like we say it yeah but it's easy to say it's easy to say yeah that's but um any ideas on how we can embrace it or bring it up to or what's the word not advertise it or but promote make yeah promote make it more of a priority yeah well i think we're doing some things right now just like your position within the department we have to make clear that it is an emphasis and a priority for the department. The hospital is doing the same thing. They're, they've created a TOH innovation program. So we're, we're making it quite clear that innovation is important and that we're investing in it. But we also have to give people rewards and opportunities and reinforcement to be innovative, to think outside the box. So we could do that at our medical school level much more than we're doing right now. We could have innovation awards instead of like, you know, the person who did the best on the ENT right. rotation. Right. Maybe you should say, who's the best, who, who's the most innovative who had the most innovative project in the medical school this year or fund research innovation. So right now they have 
you know, they have research, summer student research programs, they have summer student education programs. Maybe we should have summer student innovation programs mm -hmm. where they have to think outside the box and do something different. When I was at the new med school inauguration this year, all the kids get up and say what they've done and stuff. This one guy has said he had a million followers on YouTube. Really? Yeah. Can you imagine? So let's grab that kid. He's clearly an innovator. There's something he's doing, which is innovative and, and progressive. Let's find out what he's done. Let's promote him. Let's support him. Let's nurture him and others around him to be innovators and create new things. So I think it does have to start at the, at the bottom as well. Yeah. Cause I think that's where it has to be. Cause like our colleagues, our ages, I feel like it's too late. You know, you never know, but I, I do feel like we're less likely to push new ideas. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you that the kids come up with genius stuff, you know, and I think, you know, whatever it is that we could use, do to promote that. And also thinking, bringing in people outside of medicine, I also think oh, yeah. is a, uh, is a good way of approaching things. Like one of the ideas that we have for the podcast is the title is going to be how, what we can learn from corporate or the business world in, in medicine. And one of the guys I just talked to yesterday, Gary Connor, who's a, like this lean, he's an expert in lean. And basically having this business person coming in to a hospital, looking at how you could just streamline a bunch of things. Like how, for example, if you got a new diagnosis of say, unfortunately cancer or whatever, how many separate visits to the hospital do you have to make? Your oncologist, your medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, maybe your palliative care team, maybe a surgeon. This is somewhat coordinated in most places, but it's not that coordinated. Mm -hmm. Like, why couldn't that be a one stop, one visit, get everything done, you know, waste less time, get your assessment done in one day. And that's from an outsider, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and I think bringing in the, an outside point of view would have a lot of merit. But well, also on that same vein, as you know, we want to invest and do more within the area of artificial intelligence and mm. deep machine learning. So that, that by definition requires a partnership of people who are well with outside the medical realm. We need right. engineers, you know, um, we need social workers. We need people who are social media savvy. We need marketers. You know, we need computer analyst experts as well as physicians. So there's a whole host of people that we can bring from outside that are necessary to make artificial intelligence actually happen. Mm -hmm. That pursuit will push us outside the hospital right. and will push us to innovation because it won't happen without doing that. And it sounds like you're a fan. I'm a huge fan. You know, it, it basically is like, you know, predictive analytics, like the Wells rules. You know, that's my thing is to do something predictive through data that helps us provide better patient care and or better decisions and better person. decisions. Absolutely. And you know, the time is now with the, it's a time of big data. There's opportunities with the internet of things and the connectivity to the internet that's available everywhere for us to pull data together and actually create new tools and utilize these new algorithms that are that computers are capable of. Yeah. Cause I think to be honest with you, a lot of physicians are feeling threatened. Mm hmm with the idea of artificial intelligence being taking over being engaged in medicine. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I, I, the example would be, I saw this study of this AI program reading. I can't remember if it was mammograms or just chest x-rays or some radi radiologic uh, modality. And it was better at reading than trained radiologists. Right. You know, yeah. like, like that's a threat. That's a real threat. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be a challenge because nobody wants to be replaced. Exactly. People have done many years of training and, um, dedicated themselves to developing the skills and then to have something just come along and replace you. But it's happened in many other fields. Right. I mean, look at the automobile industry. It used to be right. a host of people on an assembly line, putting cars together. Now it's robots. Mm -hmm. The world moves on. There'll still be a role for diagnostic imaging. I'm sure not all modalities will be taken over by AI. But this is the sad thing, right? If AI can do it better, then it should be used. Absolutely. Like this, it's, it's a sad thing, perhaps for some, but life will move on. Things will change, you know? Well, yeah. and from the clinical medicine perspective, I doubt the computer will ever, ever completely replace the physician. You still have to get a, how to, you still have to elicit the history properly. You still have to examine the patient. You still have to input accurate data in order for predictive algorithms to work. So 
Mm -hmm. So right now, AI is more poised to take over imaging, I would say, both pathology and Actually, diagnostic yeah. imaging. Yeah. But it's not quite there mainstream yet for, for medicine. And all of us who practice clinical medicine, we all know there's not enough of us anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of people talk about, oh, I wish we had more physician extenders, physician assistants, nurse practitioners. We're too busy. The population's aging, getting sicker, living longer. Mm -hmm. We either need many, many more doctors or we need changes in the system that enable us to manage these patients. Yeah. And AI could enable that. And AI too, along the decision making idea, it will allow us to be more objective in some of our decisions, you mm -hmm. know, and like, you know, the takes out some of the subjectivity that, you know, once again, are related to some of the biases that we all have, but mm -hmm. including physicians, you know, like, and the thing I find sexy about AI is the fact that on paper, these decisions become better and better with more information that, yeah, it's very cool with, with more time. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, what's going to be better for our patients? Mm -hmm. What's going to be better for my mom, when she's in a circumstance that needs accurate decisions and, and specific treatment. Or you in 30 or 40 years, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. We should want the best for everybody, not just ourselves. Because I, I do feel, not only amongst maybe fields that might be threatened, but I, I still feel like within just even traditional, even people that are doing research, the idea of, implementing machine learning approaches and artificial intelligence is not well received. Really? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's unfortunate. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you a bit offline about some of the struggles our group is going through, but hmm. it's coming. So I think change is tough. Absolutely. <laughs> but I always say adapt or die, yo, like it's, it's time. Yeah. Phil, you talked earlier a bit about your pet peeve being, or one of your concerns being like resource utilization I wonder if we could just have a quick convo about some of the little things that, you know, we prescribe or we order that probably don't make a difference. And on the flip side, like thinking about what we could do with those resources, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are many and, you know, you just have to go to the Choosing Wisely initiative to see a long list of things that are done that are inappropriate and cost a lot of money you know, ECGs in healthy people before surgeries, for example, yeah. or chest x-rays in patients before surgeries that are healthy. And thankfully we do less and less of that, but in some places that's still a practice. At the Ottawa Hospital, we do PTTs when we really want an INR. That's a blood test for how thin your blood is, but it's pointless. It, it tells us nothing. We order thousands and tens of thousands of dollars of that every year unnecessarily. Another test called the ESR uh, which is really only useful in a, in a couple of fairly rare diseases. We, we order to the tune of $168,000 a year at, wow. at the Ottawa hospital. So there are many, but many and, and diagnostic tests that we order tests for superficial phlebitis, imaging tests for superficial phlebitis rather than relying on patient symptoms, for example. Mm. So there are many, many examples. And of course, the downside of that is those resources are not available for special programs or other programs that we want to expand upon. And they're not available for us to innovate. Mm. So yeah, there's countless resource misuse, which leads to problems within the system. Yeah. I feel like just addressing this alone, like these misuse, I don't say misuse, these unnecessary tests, mm -hmm. is un unnecessary diagnostic imaging. Think about all you could do with that money. And I think even here, it might have been here somewhere else, chlorides, another marker in the blood, an electrolyte in the blood. I think we spend over six hundred thousand dollars on that test, and the amount of times that it's I need it to make a decision on your care, rare, <laughs> rare, yeah. And I just think of all the stuff that we could be doing: full time social worker, physiotherapy, all the little things that make a difference in the patient experience and patient outcomes. Grief counseling the episode we we're doing t not that long ago on grief exposure and, and having that support for f patients and their family. Like there's so much that we could be doing mm -hmm. and it's just, I don't know, sad is it's disappointing because right. I think it's, if we're more aware of these things, maybe there's a change in, in practice. But as we talked about before, we're, we're a pretty stubborn group. Yep. Yeah. Common sense does not prevail. 
Amen. <laughs> okay, so we're at the tail end of this, Phil, and I'm wondering, I'd like to leave on a positive note, a story or a time where you felt your influence has made a difference in patients or clinicians or in, at an administrative level. When, when has Phil felt like he's made a difference? You know, I think there are many patient examples, but I don't actually save those memories perhaps the way I should, because I think it's just my job mm. to do the right thing for patients and connect with patients and make them feel like I care because I do. So I don't have a specific patient one that comes immediately to mind, but I guess the one that's most satisfying for me, and other people have heard me say this before, is that the Wells rules are used in medical schools and by trainees all around the world in guidelines all over the world. And I like to believe it's probably made a big difference in patient outcomes. And people come up to me when I go to meetings, they want to take pictures with me. In some cases, they wanted my autograph. Other people just are so pleased to meet me and then meet the person who created those rules. And it's satisfying because I like to believe that the reason why they're happy to meet me is because I've made an impact on them and the way they practice medicine. And therefore it's made a difference on patient care. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. That's what I'm here for. That's what, that's what we're here for. I got to tell you what, like, like I said at the beginning, I was awestruck when I saw the, the Phil Wells <laughs> during that OSCE and I couldn't agree more. I think if people are approaching in that manner, it's because you've made a difference and an incredible impression. You know, and I want to thank you for joining us on uh, Solving Healthcare. And it means a lot. I know you're a busy man and uh, taking the time, it means a lot to us. So thanks well, very much. I really appreciate you asking me and, and thank you for involving me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you want to leave any comments, leave them at quadcast99 at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at quadcast. If you're a fan of the show, please leave a review rating on iTunes. It helps with the visibility of the show and you know we're just trying to change that boogie. Honestly, thanks for the continued support and we really appreciate it and look forward to connecting with you soon.